Good morning. My name is Ken Gibb from the University of Glasgow and the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence. My short video is going to hopefully complement the other videos for this session. What I want to do is provide you with some general comments about how one goes about making the case for a housing-led recovery programme. I say make the case, I really mean uh, draw on and utilise uh, economic arguments which might hopefully influence and persuade uh, government agencies and particularly treasuries and finance departments. But as we'll see, my talk goes a little bit wider and hopefully deeper than that as well. So first question to ask really is, what sort of housing contribution are we talking about? There are well evidenced reasons for uh, promoting housing as a channel to support economic re recovery. Things to do with multipliers, the capacity of the industry, the ability to impact economically relatively rapidly. But while that may be true in most cases, it doesn't of itself determine either the shape or the balance, the combination of interventions that such a programme might take. So in the UK, for instance, while uh, social sector stakeholders would be uh, pretty sharply articulating the case for a social and affordable housing investment. There's actually in government quite a lot of discussion about so-called easy private sector interventions. So there's discussion of the likelihood of a stamp duty holiday to uh, encourage people to transact in the housing market uh, because the cost of mobility will be reduced as it were and uh, also uh, to extend the use of the UK government's probably most favoured housing policy in recent years to help to buy stim stimulus through, through the house building industry. That's already uh, on the table as it were. So that's all true and there are of course costs and benefits associated with those programmes. It's worth saying for instance that help to buy was introduced in the UK quite a few years after the depth of the uh, recession in, in the housing market. And it's not clear to me immediately that even though it's a long established programme and builders clearly know exactly how to use it, it's not clear to me that it can be as effective in the teeth of an unprecedented recession as we all expect to be moving into. Anyway, I want to talk about making the case for affordable social housing interventions, in particular supply programmes, but as we'll see, not just supply programmes. And I want to start by distinguishing a little between economic appraisal arguments and merit good or social justice ones. The conventional uh, rhetoric is that uh, those organisations and trade bodies and charities supporting uh, the, the social housing investment case have tended to do so using arguments about justice and fairness, poverty, inequality, etc., and less so to have used the more orthodox conventional economic arguments. That's changing, undoubtedly. Certainly in Britain, it's changing a lot, and I think it's changing in Australia too. But in practice, I think we can probably reasonably use both sets of arguments. But it is, I think, a necessary condition that the social or affordable housing investment case is made using conventional economic arguments because they can be relatively compelling for, for housing. But also, uh, increasingly, it's possible to use monetized or financial or, or relatively economistic versions of some of those social justice arguments, particularly in relation to well-being too. And I'll talk about that in a few slides. So making the case, what's the first thing we normally talk about? We normally talk about the counter cyclical ability of social and affordable housing to invest in programs independently of the state of the market and where the market cycle is. So we know there's lots of evidence that says these housing investment programs have large GVA benefits. They create a lot of FTE jobs. The benefits often stay fairly localised through the supply chain. And during a recession, it can be the only game in town, which means that there is some market power that uh, the buyers of supplies for construction can benefit from. But I think 
all that may be true, but at the same time in England, at least, the, the development model for housing associations has become significantly pro-cyclical and expertise and capacity is, as it were, relatively pro-cyclical. And by that, I mean the sector has come to rely more and more on the market through sales, cross-subsidy, and uh, pro-cyclical activity working in partnership with the private sector. And that probably at least reduces to an extent the capacity of the sector to respond in the way that's imagined. It's also clearly, you know, as a starting point, really important that there's an objective evidence base by which there's a reasonable need for the affordable social housing that's required. And clearly in, in the UK, both in England and in Scotland, there is well documented and robust in a housing needs estimate sense, there are robust levels of, high levels of housing need. Other issues that are important from a kind of wearing an economics hat are to, you know, people rightly worry about the uh, added value of investments, in this case, housing investments. And there's traditionally been a worry from uh, government economists about crowding out, but in the context of, of recession, uh, this is much less of an issue because clearly the surplus ca ca capacity and the private sector demand uh, is weakened. So we expect the market response to be less. And I think that means that uh, we shouldn't worry as much about those sorts of things. Another area of concern is dead weight versus, versus additionality. How, how much of the new housing might have come about anyway? What other solutions might people have opted for which didn't require social affordable housing and investment. And I think the recent work that uh, Savills did on uh, additionality and affordable supply kind of puts a lot of that to bed. It essentially says that there are certain conditions by which the additionality of the social and affordable investment would rise from 50% towards 100%. And one uh, unintended consequence, as it were, of the uh, the uh, consequences of the COVID crisis and the shutting down of the economy is that those kind of conditions that Savills laid out have been largely met. I think another interesting feature is of course the very imbalanced regional housing system and economy in England in particular, where the North struggles to achieve the land value uplifts which are so important in the cost benefit analysis of investment appraisals about investing for instance, social and affordable housing. And uh, that has you know, traditionally raised uh, problems for the North in a context of supply driven programs. And that, as we'll see in the next slide or two, uh, may be something that may be overcome as a result of certainly the, the proposals for revisions to the Green Book that the uh, UK government are talking about. So the other issue uh, that's needs to be sorted out when one's thinking about these programs is the uh, market failures that might be involved. So government economic assessment is going to look, start looking for specific market failures that need to be addressed. There's a separate question about the most effective way of addressing those market failures, but this might concern the coordination of land, land assembly. It may relate to market power in the land market in particular. There may be informational problems, capital market imperfections externalities, missing markets, all of these issues may pertain and would need to be thought about by the state. So alongside estimates of unmet need, there's a question of dysfunction in the market per se. And the investment appraisal case obviously moves on from these market failure, perhaps merit good items, into kind of more formal social cost benefit analysis. And Recently, in 2018, there's been some, an interesting kind of body of work created by a Ahuri in Australia looking at uh, the cost-benefit analysis and investment appraisal challenges that social housing has to, has to, the hurdles that they have to clear. And the argument is essentially that the orthodox cost-benefit analysis model hasn't been kind to social housing investment compared to other sectors like transport. Although actually what they're saying is that for various good and less good reasons, um, the cost benefit analysis that's been done for social housing hasn't been as 
consistent, robust, or, or building a body of literature which produces consistent variables, consistent values and parameters. And as, as a result, it's harder to get to the table to discuss your investment appraisal when you compare it to transport, which does have these consistent variables and consistent values or parameters. As I said earlier, uh, land value uplift is a key, key measure used to capture the, the benefit of development to, to households. Uh, it's a kind of welfare economics benefit. Uh, and that has become uh, you know, a really important part of, of the appraisal. But the Green Book, which is the UK government's uh, template for doing these investment appraisals, is an evolving and dynamic document and set of ideas. And what that means is that what is counted uh, as benefit or as cost changes over time, and that it may be the case that housing investment may actually improve as a as a space in which you can make telling arguments to treasuries. What sort of things are going on? Well, first of all, uh, there's much more uh, comfort about the idea of measuring uh, a monetized value of well-being, for instance, which we'll come back to. Uh, the Boris Johnson government has made it clear that they plan to support the leveling up of regional investment to help the north of England. Uh, and that they'd use alterations in some way to the Green Book to facilitate that. So it may be the case that in future, the problem of lower land value uplift in the north may be lessened or mitigated by those changes. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, the Green Book also suggests an appraisal that people like MHCLG use will also recognise that land value uplift interacts with other things. So labour productivity gains created by more affordable housing may in fact overlap with the land value up uplift and we need to be careful about double counting. But an area that I've become increasingly interested in recently is in working with uh, HACT is uh, thinking about their social value bank, which is a, essentially a conventional welfare economics way of trying to calculate the monetary value of well-being changes occasioned by uh, uh, some form of intervention or change in people's lives. So what it tries to do is measure the income equivalence of the value of that well-being change. So things like having good neighbours, living with green space, uh, relief from anxiety, depression, other mental health issues, being able to live in secure and affordable housing, all of these things can be estimated as having a, a personal well-being impact. And clearly you can factor that up by the, the scale of the intervention that, that you're making. Uh, and recently we've seen studies uh, in both the UK and Australia which have attempted to use these estimates and measures to contribute to what we understand to be the positive impacts of social housing. So Andy Nygaard, for instance, uh, has in parallel done some really interesting work in Australia, making use of the Australian version of the Social Value Bank. Another area which has become increasingly important and is referred to in some of that Ahuri research I mentioned is the sort of preventative case for housing investment. This idea is that affordable housing investment should be viewed as spending now to save later, that you can reduce failure demand, you know, you can reduce the costs of uh, the NHS or health costs or other social services. You can reduce homelessness costs and you can have a better educated and more productive labour force. So making an investment in safe, secure, affordable, good quality housing has long-term benefits, both in terms of making people more productive, but reducing some of those failure costs because they became homeless and there had to be all service provisions or because they became more ill and there were all these health service costs. Another way of looking that, at that is to talk about avoided costs to other budgets. So housing investment under the housing programme leads to lower requirements in other budgets. And you could, some, you, could, you could, in a sense, bank that saving and attribute it to the housing investment. So that raises some, some pretty obvious questions. How do you actually account for these preventative benefits? And in particular, how do you cash the savings so that they can be realised where they occur and when they occur across different parts of the public sector, given that it's going to take place over long periods of time. So how meaningful is it really 
to talk about future budgetary reductions and to cash them, to save them, to treat them now in terms of the benefits of the investment. I think, I think we would all realise that there are some issues around that. And in the literature on prevention and preventative spending, the key issue seems to me to be about how do we incentivise agencies and government to reward prevention? Reward prevention in terms of individuals, so if we come up with good, good ideas, and take them through, but also to encourage organisations to invest in prevention. So can they get financial benefits from that? Can it be linked to developing outcomes-based delivery like social impact bonds, perhaps, or other funding models based on that. There's been interesting work in London and homelessness prevention, which is trying to do exactly that. Could we perhaps create future spending credits that arise because of our prevention success in some way, which is a, a measurable and identifiable thing? So I think most people would argue that these preventative arguments are, are admirable and sensible and supportable and are clearly in some cases successful. Early years intervention seems to be better integrated to other programs than in other areas where there are real physical barriers, to use the metaphor of, uh, of silos, which can be quite rational, where public budgets do not really easily integrate across departments, where there are clashes of cultures across departments, famously known uh, in terms of health and social care integration, that there'd be a lot of culture clashes between council social work departments and the NHS for instance. All of these things uh, really make it difficult to uh, achieve over often different long-term timescales uh, and the different kinds of outcomes across spending departments make it quite hard for it to work. One other way that might be possible is to use certain innovative vehicles within government such as uh, partnership bodies like community planning and the like to have some element of compulsory budget sharing that's possible, but it's clearly difficult in practice. So I'm left thinking that the preventative case is of course important. We all know these things happen and that they matter, but they're actually very hard as a generality to capture and not at least to cause some small p political problems as well as some proper public finance difficulties as, as well in, in making that case too strongly. So my final slide, just in this walk around some, some of these issues is to say that we know that affordable supply helps labour supply function and it can help grow the metropolitan economy. So there's something going on there beyond simply the fact that housing is a, you know, supports big multiplier effects and good for the economy but can actually help the supply side of the metropolitan economy. It's not necessarily still the best use of scarce public resources. So sure, we know construction and housing investment have high multipliers, but there are other sectors and areas which have high multipliers, indeed higher multipliers. So for instance, it's been shown in a recent piece of research on Scottish housing investment that uh, the multiplier for the running cost budget of the Scottish government is actually higher than the construction multiplier. So there might have been you could argue if you're going to simply base this on the value for money in terms of multiplied outcomes, direct, indirect and induced effects, that you might better plow in the money straight forward into an expansion of the, of the public sector. So these arguments have to be multiple. They have to be multiple in terms of dimensions of what they cover. They can't simply make an argument on the basis of, of the multiplied effects because there's almost, with the exception of one sector, everybody else is going to have some higher multiplier to uh, have recourse to. Andy Nygaard also argued in his uh, work in this area in Australia that there are some big assumptions made uh, in, in using the kind of social value bank models, etc., about who benefits from programmes. So it's one thing to say we're going to build 100 units of affordable housing and we're going to target it at homeless people. But A, is it actually homeless people who take up the housing? And secondly, what else might they have done? What, how might they have solved their housing problem other than uh, the affordable housing if it had not existed? So there might be an element of dead weight to consider. But more than that, I think there's also a question about when we, when we talk about the, uh, the broader preventative outcomes, we have to make assumptions about how the recipients of the affordable supply will actually change their behaviour. So for instance, if somebody's homeless, 
and they are provided with this new affordable housing unit, how will that impact on the probability that they'll uh, go into the workforce and up the employment rate and, and work? Uh, that critically depends on uh, how the employment rate of the previously homeless actually uh, actually translates into practice. So uh, recent work in Scotland by Stephen Boyle has, uh, has raised this issue di di directly. And I think, again, it's an important caveat to think about the assumptions we make about the, the benefits that these programmes have. I mentioned at the outset that an important question relates to the, the uh, type of housing supply programme and, and whether it's a kind of market-led sector, affordable social programme sector. And, and also what's important is how it's actually paid for and how it's financed, etc. But of course, it doesn't need to be new, new built. There's some merit in thinking about refurbishment, improvement or retrofit projects, particularly around carbon reduction. Uh, they're labour intensive, large environmental benefits, your building capacity and something that's going to be required into the long term as a kind of structural value, not just a cyclical short run value. And much of that can be estimated value by sort of green book cost benefit analysis, taking account of the value of carbon reduction, etc. So I'm involved in a project in Glasgow where we're looking at the retrofit of pre-1919 tenements. And that's been a, a really interesting exercise in beginning to think about the potential positive impact that both carbon reduction and supply capacity growth could have by creating a new industry, a new set of jobs and being a leader in that kind of se sector because of the large scale of retrofit that would be required. So I think it's important that we distinguish between the cyclical requirements and the structural requirements and, and recognise that there will be a, a need for us to say which policies are simply short run recovery ones and which ones are actually there for the long term. We want our policies to have that longer term uh, sustainability, as it were. And that's also about uh, recognising that there are actually lots of existing policy intervention tools already out there. We don't necessarily need to invest in, 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 in innovation. Uh, there may well be quite good uh, well understood and implementable policies that are already in place and are geared up to be developed, delivered at scale. Our colleague uh, Derek Ballantyne helped us in the Shaping Futures programme and, and made the point that despite the kind of necessary condition of having a strong economic case to make your argument, you also have to have political support. He argued that investment in affordable social housing is actually about political will and it's about program building so that you've got the funds in government to do that and you need those funds because no matter how you cut it up we're always going to need some kind of subsidy to to deliver low-cost sub-market housing so there will always need to be that coalition building between government across its stakeholders but critically a coalition between the housing department and the uh, and communicating their plans and programs using these economic arguments is critical to uh, convincing treasuries and finance departments. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, turn off my presentation at that point, and I, I hope you've found something that has been of value in what I've been saying, and at least something which can provoke some more uh, a, a discussion in the in the session. So thanks very much and I'll finish there.